everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar on lending fintech landscape in India with three of the leaders of this space, Mr. Ram Ayer, Mr. Akshay Herotra, and Mr. Vasant Sridhar. Ram is the founder and CEO of Vayana Network, India's largest supply chain finance platform, which aims to democratize access to affordable finance for MSMEs. Ram is a serial entrepreneur with over 25 years in cash management and trade finance space, providing solutions to some of the largest banks in India and globally. Previously, he was the co-founder and CEO of Cash Tech Solutions, a leading cash management service provider in Asia, which was later acquired by Nasdaq-listed Fundtech. Given his experience, Ram carries an exceptional understanding of B2B trade, payment ecosystems, technology, and how to merge all of them for the benefit of last mile B2B lending. A very warm welcome to you, Ram. Hey, thanks, Mandeep. Uh, welcome, Akshay and Basant. Next, we have Mr. Akshay Mehrotra, who is the co-founder and CEO of Five, India's leading consumer lending application focused on young working professionals. Five is an innovative lending platform that has changed the way consumer loans are taken in India by bringing together new credit scoring systems as well as superior customer profiling. Akshay, who is actually a marketer by heart, has over 12 years of work experience with some of India's biggest brands, including Future Retail, Policy Bazaar, Big Bazaar, and Bajaj Allianz. In recognition of his business and marketing acumen, he was featured in the list of Business World's 40 Under 40 in 2019 and honored with the Most Talented Chief Marketing Officer of the Year Award in 2013-14 by CMO Asia. Glad to have you join us, Akshay. Thanks, Pandeep. Looking for a good conference. Thank you. Last but not the least, we have with us Mr. Vasant Sridhar, co-founder and chief sales officer at Off Business. Off Business is a profitable unicorn. It's a new age B2B commerce and fintech startup that provides smart procurement and smart financing solutions to SMEs through its tech-enabled platform. Off Business serves as a single window for SMEs in the manufacturing and infrastructure sectors for all procurement, supplier financing, and project financing needs. Vasant is at the forefront of a ton of innovation that's happening in B2B commerce and SME finance today. Prior to co-founding Off Business, he also founded Bloodline Labs and has had, held several positions at ITC. A very warm welcome to you, Vasant. Thanks, Mandeep, and privileged to be here with Akshay and Ram. All right. Thank you guys once again for joining this webinar. I want to begin by mentioning a few interesting facts. India, as you know, is the world's third largest fintech market behind only the US and China. Around 1,000 fintechs have been funded till date and around $28 billion of capital has been invested in the sector since 2014. The sector also boasts of, boasts of over 15 unicorns as of March 2022. That said, there exists a massive opportunity in credit still, as India continues to be a largely underpenetrated market. Our household credit, which as a percentage of nominal GDP, stands at 34%. It's quite low when we compare it to developed markets where the number stands at 65%. Over 1 billion people today require access to formal credit. SME financing gap, in fact, stands at $300 billion, with more than 150 million MSMEs requiring access to capital. Now, through this webinar, I want to touch upon why some of these gaps still exist. What are some of the measures that the fintechs today are trying uh, to bridge them? And what more needs to be done in the coming years, both from the tech startup world, as well as the enabling regulatory world? So with that, let me start with Ram here. Despite lending being one of the oldest industries, Ram, why do you think gaps still exist for serving SMEs and MSMEs? Well, I think the uh, problem is threefold. I guess, um, you know, everybody obviously has put the spotlight on access, uh, figuring out how to get access or distribution into the uh, smallest MSMEs. And I think a lot of the credit gap that is mentioned in stats is all related to that. I think the uh, second problem that is really is structural. Um, I think uh, the fact of the matter is that if you take out the 7,000 large businesses in India, the ticket sizes uh, go down alarmingly for lenders to get excited about. And then it requires either a kind of a new age finance that a lot of other fintechs have started. 
but it's kind of unprofitable at those levels. So the trick really is to figure out a lot of different models to kind of make that attractive to uh, lenders. So I think you have very, very small size credit, very dispersed population of uh, you know borrowers, um, all unique in their own rights. Um, and India, of course, does not have an information deficit problem of the past. But having said that, it still is a lot of work to kind of get to them. So I think that's the second part. Structurally, we just have to figure out how to kind of make low ticket financing attractive. But I think the third bigger problem, and I think, uh, you know, is really the credit unreadiness of most of the you know, businesses, at least I can speak of. I don't know much about consumers. Uh, but, you know, the businesses side is a lot of credit unreadiness on their part. And I think that's an area that I think a lot of work will have to get done in. And like education and health, I guess it's a very, very slow boil, a lot of investment um, and returns much ahead in the future. So I think for most of us, the focus really has been on the low-hanging fruit. Um, and I think as we start going down to this uh, lower end of the segment, I think what we'll have to really invest a lot of money is in education. Uh, and when I say B, it's not just fintechs, it's not just banks, it'll probably have to be a whole bunch of DFIs and government. But I think we'll have to make them ready for credit. We have to understand what it means to have credit in their business. They have to understand the grammar of credit. Uh, they have to understand how to kind of manage their businesses better before they take credit. You know, I, I think it's all making them healthy before you kind of get them ready for credit. Uh, and I think that's a lot of work. So I think those are three reasons why I think lending is always very difficult after you finish the easy bit. Um, you know, and very often I often talk to investors, which is not really great, is that <laughs> India is like a very, very large swimming pool. Um, you know, it looks like an ocean from a distance, uh, but it's actually it doesn't have too much depth uh, in terms of what is easily available. You really have to kind of, uh, you know, not confuse the swimming pool for the ocean. Uh, at this point in time. It's going to take a lot of work to dredge it up and make it as ocean, I guess. That's very interesting, Ram. Um, and, you know, underserved and unserved are typically the terms which we associate with the credit markets, not uh, under ready. So very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, moving on to you, Akshay, what do you think are some of the uh, consumer lending segments in particular where significant gaps still exist and which should be bridged? Mandeep, India is a very interesting market. I think it's rather uh, for the consumer side, we see banks being very aggressive when it comes to opening accounts. We have seen the government pushing, um, uh, let's say, savings capability across the economy. Uh, and there is, uh, I would say, almost 80-90% of uh, anyone who has an income definitely has some format of a account access with a bank. Uh, while we talk about this, if we look at the access to credit, has been only to, let's say, uh, 36 to 38 million people, which means that close to 250 million people still who are income generating have access, don't have access to any credit. And if you look at most of the time, uh, PSL lending has been to struggling class, and then innovation also happened to the struggling class. But there's a large middle layer we call aspiring or the next billion consumer, uh, let's say 20 to 35, earning between 15 to 50,000 rupees. This is where uh, banks find it unprofitable to lend to them. While this is where consumerism comes first, people start using credit to improve life. Uh, and uh, this is where the larger than life opportunity lies. And when you look at that segment, uh, it's almost more than 200 million households, right? And you don't see any, uh, it's like a, uh, maybe a combination of many countries put together or many continents put together when you have such an opportunity to serve. And this is where I think innovation is now going to take place, more to service this consumer, more to do with how do you become larger and attract more people there. Thanks for that, uh, Akshay. And I do uh, you know, recognize that Pipe in particular is uh, targeting aspiring individuals, as you call them, right? So aspiring individuals uh, who want to take credit to, as you were saying, better their lives. So completely makes sense for productive purposes. Um, moving on, I actually, I think uh, Vasant has dropped out. Uh, let me continue with you, Akshay. Uh, in the consumer lending world, what are uh, some of the tech innovations currently ongoing to make lending more consumer and business friendly? So I think the first level of innovation which took place was capability of lending to a consumer in runtime. Typically today, if you look at players like us and many other players, decisioning science has come down to a few seconds. So there's no one waiting if he needs to be given money, yes or no. 
the next level innovation is taking place to that uh, credit becomes invisible, right? And it's a part of your life, how to enable more products. It could be, uh, let's say you decide that I'm underinsured, can I buy more health insurance? If it comes on a monthly mode, it's more convenient to you and it's invisible in that format. Similarly, you buy a car. Um, today, if you look at cars can also be purchased, hired, leased. But imagine if your insurance is also on a, on a daily payment mode, et cetera, coming in. So innovation comes where technology enables many new spaces. Uh, if I look at the credit market, um, three levels of further innovation is taking place. One is on risk management, where you go beyond looking at traditional variables to say yes or no to a customer. Today, many of the fintechs, uh, especially us, we're also moving on sound, voice, and visual recognition beyond, let's say, traditional scorecards on bank statements and bureau. The second is coming to figure out alternate data and recognition of the customer because of his working profile. It could be a gig economy uh, worker. It could be, a, let's say, a gray collar, blue collar employee. How do you get access to his employment data and using that employment data to lend to him? And that becomes a very interesting area. The third is where you actually become a part of uh, fueling demand building. This is where because credit comes early to you, you help him plan, save and organize credit better. Uh, and when you combine these three things is where you see the new fintechs lar coming, emerging larger. You see them uh, doing both sides of banking, not just lending, but also saving. And then they become much larger as an ecosystem play as they go along. Thanks, uh, Akshay. So basically, a uh, lot of scale enabling and uh, picking out the right kind of consumers to lend to is uh, is where the magic is lying, right? Oh, absolutely. And if I look at on the demand side, let's say when we started the financial year, we were getting close to quarter of a million people approaching us each month. And if I look at last month, we got 2 million people who actually downloaded the app looking for money. So demand side is phenomenally up. I think it's really about the lender's capability to service more and more consumers, find ways of underwriting that customer, and finally providing credit at a very rational price. It does not mean that you are um, not profitable for bank, uh, means that you can't make money on the consumer. It also doesn't mean that the consumer has to pay the difference, right? How do you bring in your OPEX cost to a, a let's say 40% lower than the next banking credit cost available. And that's what we're really focusing on. Understood. Thanks for that, Akshay. Vasant, uh, while gaps currently uh, exist, um, but given the number of uh, lending fintechs and SME lending fintechs that have cropped in the market uh, for quite some time now, do you think that the conundrum on how to set, uh, evaluate these SMEs for lending has been resolved? So, you know, I'll sort of start with uh, talking about uh, why is there, uh, you know, the question of why is there a gap in lending despite lending being there forever, forever, right? I think it also boils down to the fact that India is a trust of economy at the end of the day. So while there are today different companies, different fintechs, different financial services uh, trying to address this market, I think it is not so easy to build a, a sustainable, unique go-to market to a segment. Uh, while there are millions of, I mean, lots of fintech and financial services players around, uh, I think not everyone today has solved two things, right? One, what is my unique acquisition strategy, which makes me differentiated from every other player out there? Or am I still going to be reliant on intermediaries out there for reaching out to these markets? Because most of them resort to uh, that mod model. And two, how am I uniquely positioned to ensure that my credit or underwriting costs in this business are kept optimum compared to the other two players? Uh, so it's a two-end problem, right? You solve for distribution and you also need to ensure that you solve for the credit quality is the lowest within your unique sourcing capability. Uh, so when you see the combination of both, uh, you'll realize that there aren't there is a bigger opportunity despite that. There aren't enough financial services providers to you know cater to uh, this. And at the end of the day, it's not a winner takes all market. Uh, every lender would want to have access to a wide range of portfolio and a wide range of borrowers. Every bor borrower would want to have access to at least five, six lenders on his balance sheet too. Uh, so given this, uh, you know, requirement also from the borrower side, uh, I think there's enough headroom to grow uh, for anyone who can do it sustainably. 
Makes sense. Uh, thanks for that, Vasant. Um, while speaking of innovation and technology, uh, we can't really exclude the various regulatory innovations that have been uh, impacting the industry. And I'll come to you, Ram, for that. How, would be great to hear how you see uh, threads in particular impacting supply chain financing and Vyana in particular. Look, I think um, you know the fact of the matter is that India is uh, exceptionally unique in the sense that uh, we have taken um, public infrastructure and public goods as the way to kind of really uh, provide access to information. And I think that's unique. It's brilliant, actually. Uh, that you know, obviously, the GST invoice, and I'm talking about B2B again because that's the only space I know. Um, you know, and now probably public credit registry and everything else coming up. I think we are going to have, have a case where the data itself is going to be available. You probably have traditional data of very high quality. I think the question really is that how do you create applications on top of it that may. And I think. A lot of the work that everybody is doing, including Vyana, is to try and make sure that we can use the data in a manner uh, that uh, ensures lower cost of credit to our borrowers. Now, TREDS is an interesting, you know, as a, you know, I keep telling people TREDS is actually a regurgitation of the Mexican model of NAFIN. Uh, and uh, I think it has great deal of potential. I think the uh, question only problem is that in India, one thing we have to recognize is if we walk, you know, kind of drive down the roads, is that India red light is also just a guideline. It is not a you know, reason for you to stop. Um, and similarly, in threads, the concept of you know forced debit on a particular date uh, is something that not many Indian businesses understand. So I think we will need a few of those changes in threads to make it really a potent force. Um, it is kind of gone past everything about 6,000 crores a month now, collectively across three exchanges. And considering that the original forecast was that it should reach now about 75,000 crores a month, it's still woefully short of the targets. But I'm just hoping that, uh, you know, a lot of the rules get changed, a lot of stuff happens for trades to happen. I think trades, I think the equivalent of international trade finance exchange that's been set up in Gift City, of which Vyana is also one of the participants, are all great ways of getting small businesses access to very high quality finance or getting finance in a manner that you know they would probably not have dreamt of. I think the key there is to make sure that it is also palatable and understood and understandable for these guys. Um, you know, you can't bring in uh, high street banking and all its jargon um, into that business. And I think uh, that's the trick to kind of figure out you know, for all of us. Um, you know, if I can just digress a bit, I think a lot of this finance uh, or, you know, kind of focus on credit and finance you know, it's really funny, especially for someone like me who's never been a banker in his life and never nothing to do much with finance, is that um, actually nobody ever starts a business thinking about finance, right? I mean, people start thinking about business of what they like to do or they got inherited it from their parents or whatever. This finance is a very afterthought. Um, and I think uh, what Akshay said about becoming invisible or what Vaina has always kind of believed in, or, you know, I think I'm sure off business, all of them, I think, would agree. I think we'll have to figure out how to kind of make it very palatable also to these guys uh, in manner that it makes sense with their overall business. So I think uh, trades is a, any exchange is a very deliberate hack. You have to go in and think about participating in exchange. Like if you want to buy shares, you have to think about it. Um, yes, Zeroza can make it really cheap for you and fast for you, but you still have to participate. So I think a lot of the work really that needs to be done by, I think, especially people like us is to kind of try and get um, that degree of palatability or, you know, degree of kind of convenience uh, to our customers uh, to make sure they can understand the process. You know, one of the interesting things I've noticed is that we have nowadays this uh, digital consent uh, for variety of things. And like all of us who have downloaded ever any uh, software on our mobile phone, we all realize that we don't pay any attention to it. Uh, we just say, okay, or agree and go ahead with it. So the whole concept of digital consent is something we'll have to rethought completely rather than just say, okay, I've ticked the box on governance and I've kind of make sure the regulators are happy with me. So I think it's just a whole bunch of first principles engineering needs to be applied. Um, and I am very happy that if you can get a lot of fintechs who don't come from the banking or the finance field to do this, because they will probably think about it in a very different way than most of us who think all the time about regulators or about financing kind of do it. So I think that's what I'm looking for. So trades, ITFS, uh, GST, invoice. I think India is going to be, an, you know, unfortunately for us, at least we are figuring out is that from India, we are not able to go abroad easily. Uh, you know, for a very different reason than in the past. Previously, we couldn't go because we were kind of still struggling. Um, you know, in terms of our infrastructure. Today, it's a complete reverse where actually the India infrastructure is so ahead that, you know, we have to actually downscale all our models and dumb down quite a few of our stuff or not take for granted. So I think all kinds of very interesting problems nowadays for Indian fintechs trying to go global, I think, um, you know, and uh, it's, it's actually quite interesting. 
That's very interesting. That was a very power packed uh, answer, Ram. And you touched upon a lot of aspects. Um, and we now that we think of treads, I think the way to think about it is basically it's at its uh, infancy uh, nascent stage and lots of iterations hopefully will come uh, over a period of time, which will make it even more smoother and efficient for Indian fintechs to uh, you know, work around with it within India. Now, when you move abroad, then it's a different, uh, nicer problem to have, right? Because dumbing down is easier than smarting up. So, well, not when you're above fifty. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will leave that decision to you know individual choice. Uh, thanks a lot for that, uh, Ram. Um, Vasant, uh, coming to you, uh, would be keen to understand how do you think uh, OCEN, Open Credit Enablement uh, Network, impacting B2B lending in general and off business in particular? So I think the beauty of OCEN is that, you know, it gives a pathway to go into smaller ticket size lending and makes it more attractive to reach out to. Uh, if you look at us, right, we would love to partner on OCEN platforms. Uh, as a lender on the balance sheet, because that would give us access today to markets where uh, traditionally, whether the ticket size of servicing for us would not make sense to compare to our current manufacturing and uh, infrastructure ecosystems. Uh, like I'll give you one end use for this. If you look at even GEM or the government uh, sourcing platform that is now on GEM Sahai, which is listed, uh, you know, using OCN networks, uh, it's a super large market, right? $40 billion of transaction today. Any SME, MSME in India would have some uh, receivable or would have some transaction with some government entity, whatever happens, right? Even if they're private uh, for other businesses. And, uh, you know, when you have, say, 8 lakh SMEs listed on that, uh, today, what can we do? We can now uh, plug into, say, a Gem Sahai as a lender, as Oxido Financial Services. Uh, we have access to transaction data that comes in. We have access to, say, GST data that's coming in. We also have access to banking data that today account uh, aggregators can come and put in. We have data to, say, credit crystal data that can come in. And today for us, where we have traditionally looked at our own, um, uh, you know, unique segments to reach out to, we can now partner as a lender to these uh, supply chains. Uh, and hence, uh, I think it makes small ticket size lending very attractive for us, which has not been our conventional ticket size till date. That's very interesting, uh, Vasan. So it's basically opening up a whole new segment uh, for you from a business perspective. Correct. And we'll use our balance sheet to reach out to these uh, customers in this. Very nice. Uh, we have, as Ram was saying, we have one of the most active regulators in the world today. And, uh, uh, you know, the idea over here is to pursue uh, what I call regulations for good uh, for all of us. Now, changing gears a little bit here, though, uh, from a consumer lending perspective, uh, regulators have been especially very active uh, in this year. Akshay, from an operator's viewpoint, what additional regulatory measures do you think uh, could be helpful for VIBE and the general B2B lending space? I think there's a year of the regulator, right? The amount of time, uh, uh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and it's finally come, the digital lending guidelines, and the amount of change the industry has to go through was phenomenal, right? I think let's first talk about what's happening in the digital lending space, right, from the regulator perspective. Uh, and let's talk about uh, what, what could help further the industry better. And the first part is uh, the regulator clearly took cognitive action to say this is the industry which is going to be disproportionately larger. I don't want to start uh, looking at very large companies as they emerge. I want to regulate the industry early, right? which means that he expects the industry to grow maybe 10x in the next two years. Right. So, which is the first part. And unless he expects that, that much, he's not going to put this much of governance around it. Right. See, today, if I look at I don't think the industry must, does in a monthly basis more than five, seven thousand crores a month. Right. So it's, it's too small from a regulator to come this heavy. Uh, the second part is if you look at the structuring that he's requested the companies to follow between the LSP, TSP, and RE, clearly demonstrates that um, the consumer in the middle. People who take risk uh, actually get the reward for it. And people who own the capital take the risk also. Right. The third part is he's given a very clear operative rule, right? And which is the most important part. Once the industry knows what is black and white, they can go and do unlimited growth. 
right because it was gray we were always wondering what to do what is correct when we be questioned now the black and white is so crystal clearly defined that it's going to become um, let's say if you are structured well you can actually go 20x in the next 3 years right now let's look at what's happening in the industry now many fintech stars uh, ram said it well innovation only happens if you don't know the category you try to look at the consumer and what plight you face and you try to solve um and most of the fintechs actually emerged like that uh, we looked at giving young people money in month end because we felt that was stuff that we were growing up in our life right many people said they listen uh, i found it very difficult to buy an iphone let me see if i can do a financing behind it that's how most most of these companies came in right but as they evolve um, uh, and they kept solving problems it became important that you own the lending entities so the guidelines became much more clearer that listen if you want to give money you should own the money so have the re in, in house etc became important the second is if you're going to process uh, as a fintech it's great to be the tsp right which means that if you're not the credit card manufacturer you can still provide a platform to give credit um using a bank credit card and give a great service for experience there right and finally if you're interacting with the consumer you have to inform everything to the consumer and not store his data for your benefit right so definitions became really clear and what's also become clear as as you keep raising more money and you have more capital and capability investing in teams at tech etc you'll try to do all three things together right which means that when you become at scale you are going to become large financial players you will not just be players with money flows through you'll own the money you'll own the licenses you'll be the lender you'll collect the money you'll be responsible for making money on that money right and this is where you start building larger than life financial companies right so i i would say he's given pathways for let's say another five more bajaj finance type companies getting created right so he's actually given very clear ways that how we can grow 20 30 times and i think uh, that i think while we started the journey because we preview to what's happening in the regulatory space compliance happened real fast if you look at most of the good boys in lending were compliant on 1st december right so players who who said listen i want to be asset heavy i want to lend all of that happened and if you look at their um, i would say the first eight, we saw the first 8 days volume coming in it's phenomenal if your compliant consumer sentiment goes up if you start showing what you're charging in fact the consumer likes it even more so why not uh, play the regulations well why not become the larger companies the perspective excellent thanks for that uh, akshay um and you know this is the kind of view we at chirate also have um very similar that the idea of regulations i was saying is regulations for good right so it will increase confidence in the system it will build that confidence in the system and um basically bring out more responsible pl- uh, players and separate the wheat from the chaff um which is ultimately going to be good if you want to grow as you're saying 10 to 20x in the next couple of years um so so hoping for the best and uh, i'm sure it's going to play out good um thank you everyone that was a very uh, in depth view uh, provided by all of you uh, for the regulations which are impacting the industry uh, moving ahead uh, about your own individual businesses i would just like to touch upon the balance between profitability and scale uh, as you've been building your startups and ram um, any suggestions that you'd like to share uh, especially for new entrepreneurs entering the supply chain financing space on how to attain this balance of constraint margins with scale i think uh, you know as long as you don't believe that you're a startup and you think you're running an age old business i think this concept of you know profitability i think automatically comes in um, i don't think it's a new concept we just seem to have forgotten it because there's a lot of capital coming from investors and we thought we could kind of run with it now uh, i think the question really i think as you know i am to tell you a colloquial expression that a co-founder of mine used in my first startup he said never start a panbidi dukan and believe you are unilever right uh, uh, so never get beyond yourself in terms of your cost um, you know and make sure because india is a very tough market from a yield perspective um, it's a very short arbitrage opportunity uh, it doesn't exist forever uh, if you look at city bank as a classic example they come into a market with a new product stay there for 3 4 years when the arbitrage is very very good and then they kind of exit the market 
uh, because they've recognized that in India, the first mover advantage will last for some time and then you kind of will cede the market to others. So I think the trick really is to keep the only thing that you know for certain, which is a cost, um, as frugal as you can. Um, that's the only mantra because the revenue itself, you have to assume that every year, uh, the yield on revenue is going to drop by 15, 20%. You should bring that into your calculation. Um, you have to assume that the, what you were getting before, if you were uh, running a regulated financial institution, if you're getting 4% NIM, you have to assume that you'll probably do 3% NIM next year. Um, you know, and, and I think India is a market where we're very, very conscious of the fact that revenue is not really in your hands all the time. If you're building an institution, if you're building a three, four year old company, you know, flipping it over, then I think it makes perfect sense to kind of chase that growth. But I think if you're building an institution, you just have to keep track of only your costs. And I think one of the lessons I think everybody is learning, and you know, if you look at the entire layoffs and everything else happening, is that if you get far ahead of the game in terms of costs, um, you will pay the price for it. Or unfortunately, or the employees pay a price for it. Uh, so I think the trick really is to just focus on costs, um, though it's kind of uh, unattractive. Uh, the growth, I think, comes in only because you do the same thing every day very correctly. Um, you know, whether it's regulatorily, whether by your systems, by your processes, I think the growth automatically comes in a market like India. If you build credibility enough, like, you know, Akshay was talking about how the number of downloads have gone up, people kind of wanting to use this platform or off business, you know, as an incredible track record. I think if you just keep doing the same thing very well every day, you will get growth. The trick, I think, only as entrepreneurs is to focus on costs, which unfortunately is not written in our grammar. Um, you know, we kind of all focused on growth or whatever it is. I think the cost part is really something that's, I think, uh, key. Lastly, I would just to touch a point, I think the key thing really, if you want to make credit affordable to your customers, because that's a market we are all in, right? Um, you have to keep your costs as a very frugal cost also, because you're not going to be adding more costs. You have to go to your lenders or, you know, if you're your lender yourself, you have to kind of say that, okay, I can pass on all the savings I'm doing on my operations, processes, people and everything else and pass it to my customers. And that's what gives me a moat in the long run. Um, so I think this whole market will turn out to be like the automakers market of the 90s, where companies that really learned how to run very efficient uh, operations, the Japanese especially, I think managed to kind of bring a lot of cost economics without sacrificing quality. Um, and I think that's really this place where I think fintechs today will have to kind of focus on. How do you get that quality without having to sacrifice you know, be, and be exceptionally efficient? Um, and so I think that's the key. And, you know, so, I mean, listen to your parents more, um, you know, uh, how, how to run a business uh, rather than focusing on, you know, your kids. <laughs> and I think you'll be okay. Understood, Ram. Uh, so basically a hawkish uh, stance on costs and not just uh, during the funding winter times, uh, during the usual business as usual times as well. Right. That's what I, so, I mean. Just be paranoid. Assume there's going to be no capital tomorrow. Yeah. And then run with it. I mean, that's the best way to kind of run it. Assuming you have a good product market fit and you've discovered all that, you have a viable proposition, you're relevant to your customers, you know, those are all, I think, basic hygiene factors. Yeah. You get to that point, then scale will automatically come in, as I said, if you're just, you know, exceptional in your execution. I think the trick is to also make sure you're exceptional in your cost engineering and cost execution. I think you can't lose sight of it. I mean, you know, I, I think that's a key. Um, you know, it is okay to be loss making. I don't say, I'm not saying that you have to be profitable from word go, but you have to be very clear why are you taking those losses? They can't be losses just because you raised a capital round and now think that, you know, you can kind of splurge a bit. You know, I mean, my biggest worries after capital raise rounds is that people suddenly assume they can take 5,000 rupees hotel rooms then 2,500, right? And then you start losing that entire frugality that's was built into the business before. Everybody just feels suddenly rich though none of the money has come to their account. Uh, the, so, you know, you've got to be as a startup, just I, I, I think we have enough history in India about how businesses were run by, you know, the legends of the business. I know Bajaj was something that, you know, um, uh, aspirationally everybody talks about in the fintech world, but they build very frugally. It's not that, they, you know, they're, they're exceptionally cost uh, focused. And that's how you build businesses for long run. I mean, uh, revenue is, a you know, I think a partly under your control, partly not under your control deals. You, the only thing you can really focus on is cost. Thanks a lot for that, Ram. Um, Vasant, uh, you know, you off business is a profitable unicorn. And at a certain level, I, I find that term to be an oxymoron because those are the two words you don't really associate uh, um, in the Indian context. Um, was it by choice or necessity or chance is one question that I'd like to address over here. And also, how much did the lending business have a part to play in the overall business's uh, profitability? 
Yeah, so it was, uh, I think, by choice on day one. And I think it's also a, f- a function of what culture you set on day one that sort of percolates at every level. I think, as Ram said, it's very tough to change cost structures. If you believe that on day one, you'll burn and day two, you'll uh, suddenly become profitable. Everyone will start becoming frugal. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, I think there's no concept of, uh, I think, for example, we have always believed that you have to be profitable at a transaction level. So, you know, don't add vanity metrics and say that you're profitable at a cluster level or profitable at an aggregate level. No. Uh, fundamental belief is it has to be profitable at a transaction level. Uh, and I know I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Oxizo, which obviously contributes to a large share of profits of our business. See, the, uh, it's always a decision of going for profit first rather than scale. Uh, because in a lending business per se, there are three heads which are not in your hand. Uh, you obviously have yields which you pass on to the customer. The reality is that in a B2B business, there's so such, such large network effects that it's very different to underprice or overprice once you've established a price. Uh, because you, you always work around the ecosystem that you've built to. So if you've lent to an SME and you're going to lend to his neighboring SME, you can't work on too much on price arbitrage between them. A few percentage points, but not more. So one price is not in your hand beyond the point, right? Based on what you've established, it needs to continue over time. Uh, the second thing, your cost of capital is more a function of vintage scale and time. It's not in your hand. Uh, you grow with profits, you grow with better ratings, your cost of capital comes down. But it's also not something that today immediately you, you have a lever on, uh, you know, to play. Uh, and the third thing that's there, and that's I think the largest misnomer is you have a credit cost. Uh, but the truth is the credit cost always hits you at the end of the third year. Uh, anything before that is just balance sheet modeling that you're doing to impress people that, yes, this is my credit cost. Uh, in fact, when it comes to optimizing credit costs, we have always believed that, you know, assume it's zero NPA. Solve for zero NPA so that you at least land with one. Uh, if you're going to, uh, we have seen businesses who, you know, bal- who model for a 3% NPA. In retrospect, once the, you know, data hits you, you realize that it's 8%. Because in lending, return of capital is more important than return on capital, right? Uh, so if you look at uh, lending business per se, three costs are not in your hand. Uh, and hence, it is extremely more important, hence, to optimize for everything at every level rather than running behind uh, revenue and scale. Uh, and I think that's a, a you know constant belief that we have had across both the trading as well as the uh, financing entities, uh, that it has to be kept tight at every level. And uh, that's a culture that's been built out. And I think that's where uh, we have some path to uh, grow also right now. <clears throat> Sorry, mute. Mute. Yeah, yeah. I was saying thanks a lot for that, Vasant. I think both your and Ram's views are more on uh, uh, oriented towards building a culture of uh, uh, living within your constraints. So from his perspective, you know, lead yields are limited. From your perspective, you know, revenues also you can't control to a lot of extent. Cost is the only thing you guys can uh, uh, try to manage to a certain extent and then build a culture of building a profitable company from the start and have a conservative viewpoint on the lending, uh, in, a, in the lending business. But both of your views are on the B2B side. I'm curious to hear what a B2C lending company uh, how how pipe things about uh, profitability and and scale together because b two c is usually the space where we see um lots of money going in and then uh, you know bottom lines getting impacted so I think the first is there has to be a customer level LTV which has to get calculated which allows you to build a business say in b two c you can't make money on a customer or on a transaction immediately. it takes time. Right. Because at least in our model, the customer has to keep coming back to us only then we'll make more money on him. But I think we have always focused on two elements. One is rationally pricing the product so the consumer is able to accept the credit cost. Second, when he looks at the product again, he says these guys were the most uh, rational in pricing first time. They're even more rational in repeat time. And my experience was much ahead in time than anyone else could uh, even think about and why should I move to anyone else, right? So today, if I look at every closing cohort, 88% of my customers repeat with me, which means I'm not losing a customer unless I did some mistake, right? Now, now it is really important. If you get such a unit economics model running in, now it's really about building the frugality in the company. So you keep your costs down. So you keep giving, getting the customer back to make more and more money, right? See, uh, at the end of the day, Companies are built only when they are profitable, right? You can decide when you want to be profitable. It could be one year, two year, five year, 10 year, 20 year, but the day you need to be profitable, you need to be. 
the end of the day when you when you spend time in your board meeting no one questions anything apart from at the what was your pat right now of course we are all going from i would say the vc funded land to the pe funded land as we all grow in life where the reviews are on a singular point yeah you grew okay great you grew a lot but tell me what did the pat grow by right what is the roe roe efficiency is coming in so you get measured on financial terms you're not no more measured on arrs and how fast you're growing right so i think that is the reality of the situation so i would say in consumer lending two good parts if you do a good job the consumer likes you and he stays with you if you do if the consumer stays with you and your delinquency really keeps coming down as you grow and at the end of the day if you understood that money is most important part of your business you can't waste it right it it will turn to profit and i think it can eventually give a 30% return on equity as a business so that's what you should drive and focus at god thanks a lot for that akshay um you know i'm just uh, mindful a little bit uh, of time uh, and i have one final question to all three of you over here um i'm i'm sure you must be talking to a lot of new entrepreneurs who come your way and giving them suggestions on how to start a lending business or what to what to look for when or what kind of opportunity to solve for but if you in particular were to invest in any particular lending business what are some of the things that you yourself will look for whether it's the business model domain team etc uh, you know yada yada yada, yada. what are some of those areas which you look to assess when uh, you will make that particular investment in that uh, lending business um house is open anybody can start maybe i can jump in here uh, i think see fundamentally uh, if i have to look at investing at a lending business i would say i would look at categories where there is a customer base to be served properly the secondly the found the the team driving that business or the founders are frugal in nature to understand the consumer has to be catered to and nothing else is important right and third the risk engine needs to really work which means that you know how to run risk as the i think these are three most important pillars of funding a, a lending entity yeah i'd like to add to what yeah akshay said in this i think the first thing when you're speaking to someone who's trying to build a financing business is to understand whether they appreciate that it's not a business of lending but a business of collection uh, and the paranoia over credit quality and correction and the understanding that money can be given easily but it's the last pie that needs to be collected i think that a uh, level of grey headedness or that level of maturity or understanding that yes it's a business of collection uh, is the first filter that would probably keep at a uh, you know at a uh, you know at the founding team level do they appreciate understand that that's what a lending business uh, you know requires uh, i think the other thing that uh, would also look at is do you have whatever segment that you believe that you are reaching out to or uh going to provide financial services to uh do you have a unique go to market or are you very intermediary driven uh because can you hold the customer because it's always about cross selling uh doing multiple things uh forward right and you can obviously keep uh, keep adding value added services over time uh in retrospect i have seen that any financial services business or nbfc per se over the bit in the b2b side built over the last 4 5 years who have been predominantly intermediary driven in sourcing and not solved for strong sourcing competency have always withered away for uh, you know whatever reasons that come in so i think uh, acceptance that it's a business of uh, begging the customer to collect more than uh, lending and ensuring that you know you have your unique sourcing and you're not intermediary driven are probably two factors to keep in mind when you want to decide whether to invest in a financial services business i don't know ram final words of wisdom i i think you know the first thing i generally i get very flummox is when people want to start lending business but don't understand the cost of equity is different from cost of debt um so you know when people come to me and say that they want to invest equity into lending i am kind of very confused so i think that's the first thing i get stumped by so generally stay away from them uh, the second is i think uh, credit type per se in my opinion uh, is not a moat 
you know, the lending business is not a mod. If you don't understand the purpose to which your customers are using the credit for and don't have a role to play in that, I think it's very difficult to hold on to credit purely as a mod. I think uh, distribution, everything else is getting challenged in countries through digital means and everything else. So I think, and you are never going to be cheaper than a bank, um, you know, honest to God, or, you know, you're not going to be cheaper than the market um, in that sense. So you're never going to have that bargaining power to kind of create a moat around your credit uh, operations. You'll have to figure out what the purpose of credit is. So I think people who come in just saying that, you know, there are a whole bunch of segments of customers who want money. I generally, again, don't understand it. I mean, I, I would like to know what do they want the money for? And, you know, and what role are you playing in that purpose rather than giving them money for just like that? I think that's the second, uh, I think, uh, thing. I think the third the important thing is to, uh, you know, really understand whether these guys have uh, made bad credit decisions, personally or professionally. I don't think there is, uh, you know, any wisdom learned from uh, if you have not lost money. Uh, so I think, you know, generally, even at least I'm looking at people, I want to know, all their bad experiences on credit and hopefully they've learned from it. Uh, but I think that's that's it. Uh, I don't invest in lending startups, so I'm sorry. Um, I don't have too much, but this is all an academic discussion. But that's what I would look for if I'm lending, I guess, so investing into a lending startup. Understood. Thanks a lot for that, Ram. And uh, big thanks to all three of you for a very candid conversation. Um, you know, candid on all fronts, whether it's talking about the industry, talking about regulations, your own businesses, as well as uh, suggestions to new entrepreneurs. Uh, appreciate your time and frankness and all the very best as your businesses grow and scale and transition from you know, our poor P VC world to a much bigger private equity worlds. Good luck.